on in. You coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we got lined up for you today. We really have a special one. First of all, we've got a movie star and singer-songwriter. Luke Evans will be swapping by the house. <laughs> and swapping Hollywood for Hampshire as he drops around the house very shortly. Uh, there's a festive theme to this week's food adventure as myself and Nick Nairn visit a reindeer farm in the Cairngorms. The incredibly talented chef Claire Smith will be back as well. <laughs> Multi-Michelin star Claire Smith. Uh, she'll be wowing us with her very special take on the humble potato. Nicola Lando will be back as well uh, with some last-minute gift ideas for the wannabe chef or foodie in your life. And don't miss this week's Little Masters, where I'll be making the ultimate mashed potato served with sausage and beer braised onions. But first, my guest in the kitchen loves his mashed potato. I do know that. Uh, he's a legend of the London restaurant world and the food scene, and is chef behind some of the capital's most iconic restaurants. It's the brilliant. It's my good mate, Mr. Richard Corrigan. <laughs> Good to How have you James? back now, Ching Ching, fella. Good Happy same. Christmas. Great wine as usual exactly. in the glass. Well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you got the brief. You see, <laughs> they said turn up. What are we going to? Slightly like James. Yeah, yeah it's a slightly like. like <laughs> slightly. We, the yeah. snug, <laughs> snug fit. So you're going to be cooking for us later. What are you going to be doing? I'm going to do a, a seasonal partridge with uh, quince, chorizo, lentils and almonds. Right, lovely. And quince is one of these amazing sort of... I mean, it is fantastic. A lot of people just see it as... You either see it at the fruit, the supermarket, not knowing what to do with it, or the little membrillo, the little jam. It's, yeah, but... it's, it's, it's one of those... One of those things, the flavour is very, very delicate, but it's great with game, great with tars, great with milfoy, great with so many... It is, yeah. I always find quince a very English, a English fruit. Yeah. I wasn't necessarily brought up with a lot of it, but I have put down some trees. We, we are growing some quince. Yeah. Uh, not as successfully as the rapids, of course. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But anyway, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we're kicking things off today. I'm going to make an instant gato. You mentioned sort of pastry, but I'm going to serve it with these incredible macaroons, which is going to speak to somebody in a minute about these. But first of all, about this gato, First of all, this is kind of like a cheats gatto because I know that everybody at home like watching baking shows and stuff like that. Do they actually make it? Do they really actually make it? Well, this is this is a cheats version. So there's no bacon in this, but this gatto would look spectacular. You don't have to do anything. Now, this is the secret of this. We've made a cake. Pretty done tart base, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember these see, tart bases that were my I used to have these when I was a kid. When um, I was very ill, my mum would then take a little bit of custard, some tinned, tinned little segments of peaches, place them on the top, and that was your, that was your dessert. But, but I remember this. But I'm going to then take this and take it to another little level, because what we're going to do is take yourself a cake ah. ring. So you can buy these on the internet, a biscuit tin. Cut the base out of the tin opener. Ask your granny first before you do that, otherwise it'll properly kick off this Christmas, uh, ruin a biscuit tin. But you take that and you're going to cut this out, like that. You can keep this, because this is great for trifles and bits and pieces, and then we end up with this. Now, what you need to do now is you need to cut this in half. The only bit of the tricky bit is this. So you take a serrated knife and you start and you work your way through, about a third of the way around, keep going all the way around, like that, until you get through to the other side. Work your three, throw it in the middle now, and you've got two discs. All right? That's the tricky bit. And don't go cheating by two sponges, otherwise the sponge is too thick. Then, take your nice little bit of cake. This sits on here, over there. Whipped cream's happening over here as well. Take a little bit of alcohol. It depends on whatever you want, whatever you've got in your cupboard, Mr. Corrigan. Just a little bit over the top, a little bit of orange liqueur. Not of goo, because what we're going to use is going to use the strawberries. So we've got the whipped cream over here. Now, we'll leave that to one side there. Then what we need to do is think about the strawberry side of it. And we're going to use these sort of larger strawberries. So the point of strawberries, you can use the small ones, but the larger strawberries, what you want to do is trim these to all roughly the same height, like that. So the larger ones. And then what we do is we take the strawberries, cut them in half, and while they're still moist because you've cut them, then you cut them and put them in down the side of the ring, like that, so they stick around the edge, all the way around, you see? I haven't baked anything yet. 
Just a bit of whipped cream. So you're liking this, are you? The quickest gato in the world. Exactly. So well, it's a little bit more work than what we got in front of over here. Like I said, I'm going to garnish these with these amazing macaroons. So uh, we're hopefully uh, we're going to visit the um, the Shropshire Hills to visit a guy called George Evans. I can see him now on the screen. Now is the owner of Shropshire Macaroons. You you're, you're I, you sat there and stood there in disbelief that I'm actually not baking anything. But why would I when I've got all these amazing ingredients in front of me, like yourself? I'll, I'll, sorry, sorry, I'll do the hard work for you. Uh, so, so tell, me, tell me how it all started then, because, we, you know, I mean, you've got your eye on these. Have a taste of a few of these, but when you get really good macaroons, they are really, really special, and yours are fantastic. Where, where did this first of all start off? Um, it's, it's, it sort of just stems from a, a love of the product, basically. However, they're not exactly uh, very prominent, but really. it's more of a bit further afield from here. So, uh, I kind of, um, every time I found them, I got my hands on them, and I was always a little bit, I know, a little bit disappointed and sort of was all wanting to find out why uh, there was such a hype around these uh, these sort of fabled treats, which everyone's sort of scared of and scared to talk about or touch. Um, and uh, so I think, I think it was sort of New Year's Eve 2018 into 19. Um, I sort of slightly inebriated, uh, ordered a, a book on how to make them. Uh, sort of full of baking content, sort of wanted to have a go at them. So I, yeah, I bought the book, uh, it arrives, and uh, I just kept, I sort of practiced and actually ate one that I made, and I was like, okay, well, this is why people love macaron. What was the name of the book? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to say it. Yeah. I know. It's something to do in Paris really well, I'll be honest with you. And the well, best yeah, macaron yeah. maker in Paris, a guy called Christian Cuttuccini. And I must say, yours compare very, very fairly with Christian's. They are, they are really delicious. Well, that's high praise Thanks for you, see, from a Michelin star chef as well. But also, you know, I mean, I've tasted macaroons in Centre Milan as well. Because yeah. I remember going there as a young kid, working in the restaurants. There used to be a macaroon, macaroon sort of uh, bakery opposite. Uh, and they used to put them on this uh, like sort of greaseproof paper and you end up yeah. sort of pulling them off your teeth at the same time because you want them quite sticky so so but you never you this is not would not your business you you trained in what down the road in portsmouth in geology didn't you that's where it all started yeah yeah so i went to study geology um at college did three years at university there um came away with a degree and went to work in the environmental industry um however it sort of wasn't quite what I wanted to do, and I sort of now realise that. Um, so I was lucky enough to be able to go and, well, I was working as a project manager and then as a consultant, and at the same time I started up this business, which um, pretty much straight from the off was maybe more than I actually sort of anticipated it to be. <laughs> uh, so the first week I had sort of 30 odd orders, and uh, from from that, you know, I've managed to sort of grow, grow the business. I sort of left the day job for a few reasons, but um, mainly because the macaron business was arguably making me more money and I was enjoying it a whole lot more. Exactly. That's so, the um, secret. And what I love about it, you're, what I love about it, you're doing this all in your own home kitchen as well, because this is the, most people have got big commercial kitchens. You're, you're still home based. I think it's fantastic. We've got, we'll speak to you again in a second, but I just want to just recap what we've got in here, because Mr. Corrigan's got one eye on the macaroons and one eye on this to put on his menu later on. Uh, <laughs> This is this is a little bit of so you, you put the, the the cream on it and then you can mix and match these lovely little macaroons you see so the whole idea of it is you sort of build this up and you can mix and match the different flavours that we got on here different colours like that as you go in so another one and build these all the way around it, I just think it's just a little bit of fun because people are so busy this time of the year in the kitchens anyway so to be able to do something you can just well, the key to this, really, if you are going to do it, is hide the packets before everybody arrives. That's probably the easiest way. And properly hide the packets, I mean, in the bin. Um, and what you want to do is... You, that one, I think. That one, maybe that one. And then you can just pop these in there like that. Now, you can decorate this with a little bit of fruit, which I will do in a second, but the key to it is, is then wait before the guests arrive, and I would just make it like this. And then what you do is you get yourself a blowtorch, you can do this with a hot cloth. It doesn't have to be one of these, but what this is doing is just loosening the cream around the edge of the ring, like that. And then when you grab your guests round and about, you can let them lift this off. Mm -hmm. 
Once a pastry chef, always a pastry <laughs> chef. <laughs> and then you just pop the fruit. <laughs> hide the packet. So, and then we just pop the fruit on here, just randomly, like that. Probably another one. But like I said, it is once a pastry chef, always a pastry chef. See, I believe I can see in the background, George, you spent ages building that Christmas tree, macaroon Christmas tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots, of, uh, lots of different colours and flavors. Exactly. The, the key to it, George, is go and get a supermarket sponge flan. That's the key to it, George. That's that's the one. Well, we're all diving into them here. They're yeah. absolutely delicious. I wish you all the very best with it as well. And what started out life as an idea from a from a cookbook that you bought. And now you've got a business as well. You're doing it properly as a career. I think it's fantastic. So this is just to finish this off. You can, you can have this one on me, this one. And what we do is we're going to take this sugar now and then you can turn this into so many different things. We can then turn this into a little sugar twist. Now, I don't know how old you are, George. Dare I ask? I'm 27. 27. 27. Mm. <laughs> mm. You need to eat, speak to, your, speak to your family about this, but I used to cook on TV before you were born, and I used to do a little show called Ready, Steady, Cook. And I would then make this with a bandana, looking a bit weird, to be honest with you, George. But there was another chef called Brian Turner who used to get really upset oh, when I used to do this, because he'd be running around like a complete nutter, and then I would do that and win. <laughs> But <laughs> 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 and then, oh, then when I had a little bit more time, you can get one of these, oh. George, like this, and you can take take this. You're going to be googling, <laughs> googling this thing. There was another, there's another couple of people that I cooked for, which was a guy called Zig and Zag. You need to Google them as well, George. <laughs> but you got okay. a nice little bit of sugar twist that we got on here, which we can just lift this off. There you go. Hopefully. Go that way. There you go. Lift that off. Wow. There you go. It's really Christmas. It is really Christmas. <laughs> George, I'm going to continue doing this, uh, but best of luck with everything. Uh, and I think what you've got is a fantastic business. The, 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 the whole thing about anything to do with food, it's all got to be in the taste. Uh, and your, they, they do say so. high praise indeed. They taste amazing. So best of luck with everything. Best of luck with everything you're doing. I'm sure people will find you on the internet and uh, we'll see you in a supermarket, I'm sure, very, very soon as you go on to um, not just cooking your, your kitchen, you'll end up with a factory with these things. So keep it up. Best of luck with everything. <laughs> yeah, thank you, James. Thank you very much. There you go, look. So you've got this little sort of nice little gatto like that, using that with these simple little macaroons. Easy as that. Anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter about food. There has to be fun. It's a bit of fun, It's isn't fun. It? It's a bit of fun, isn't it? It's fantastic. How you eat it, I've got no idea. It's not my fault. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to everybody else. Still to come, we've got dishes from this chap, Mr Richard Corrigan, and Chef Claire Smith, uh, and I'll be joined in the kitchen by my special guest, Luke Evans, very shortly. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, I'm teaming up with Chef Nick Nairn on a food adventure to the stunning Cairngorm Mountains. I'll see you in a bit. I think you're going to try that for this Christmas. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'll be teaching you the right way to make the ultimate mash in this week's Little Masters. An actor-turned-singer, Luke Evans, will be dropping by the house very shortly. Right, it's time to take a look back at one of my favourite ever food adventures. And this week, my travels are taking me to the Cairngorm Mountains, where me and my mate, Nick Nairn, are dropping in on one of the country's only reindeer farms. Enjoy this one. So, we're en route now for a, a little surprise for you, because you may or may not know that Around here somewhere uh -huh. it is a herd of reindeer, wild reindeer. Now, I have heard of this, and I kind of thought it was an urban rumour. I didn't yeah. think it really existed, do they? Well, apparently they're native to the UK. I didn't know this. There's now about 150 of them. Are you joking? 150 yeah. reindeer. 150 reindeer roaming around here. What happens at Christmas time? The sign that come up they here... They fly and... away. <laughs> <laughs> We're meeting Fiona Smith at the Cairngorm Reindeer Centre. She's one of the team who look after this unique free-range herd. 
Hey, how you doing? Good, thanks. How you going? I'm very good. How never... are you? <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. I have too. to say, I don't think I've ever seen a reindeer before oh, in real you life. Know. I bet me, you didn't think me. you'd see in Scotland either. Me neither. Uh, why is their coats coming off? Uh, so just now they're losing their old winter coat. Okay. Um, so it is literally coming off in handfuls. Uh -huh. Look at that. Help yourself. Oh, it's literally just coming off. Um, this one's hungry. Yes, this is Dr. Zeus. Dr. Dr. Zeus is always hungry. Um, and yeah. the finer, darker coat you're seeing underneath is their summer coat. Yeah, right. And the antlers, they're, they're like velvet. Mm -hmm. So the velvet skin is protecting the bone that's growing underneath. So they're growing their antlers just now. So they're quite delicate. They're very delicate. They're very sensitive. Um, there's a really rich blood supply and they're growing the bone underneath, full of nerve ends. So if they break an antler just now, it's like you breaking your arm. Mm. It's part of them. It's growing bone. Yeah. Um, so they grow between March and August. Come the end of August, blood supply cuts off. Velvet strips away, and then that's the solid bone antlers that you see them with. And do they shed them each year? Every year, yep. So what do you feed them on? Okay, so we... Whatever's in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, something's <laughs> interesting. So we give them a cereal mixture that we make up ourselves. Okay. Barley, sugar beet, a urine lamb mixture. Okay. Uh, which they love and works very well for hand feeding. Would you like to hand feed a reindeer? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. first... They you... cannot bite you. Cup your hands, okay. you get the flat hand for the horse. Okay, oh we go. Now, Dr. Zeus, you are one hungry reindeer. <laughs> and, oh, you've got a really nice nose. Yeah, yeah, they're completely covered uh, in hair. Yeah. They've got tiny, tiny teeth, so oh. they literally cannot bite you. Do you know, reindeer are my new favourite thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Why here? I mean, it's just beautiful here, but why so, here? Um, this specific herd, this, they came here um, back in 1952. Right. Um, wow. So they were reintroduced, so reindeer are native Scotland. Wow, that is amazing. So they died out about eight to 1,200 years ago. Predominantly, these were bred for meat originally, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they still are. You know, reindeer um, is a staple diet right across Scandinavia still. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, this herd initially was brought over in the kind of maybe another good meat source yeah. sort of post-war, but actually the general Brit didn't want to eat reindeer and as a display herd and through tourism, that's now how they um, earn their keep. These guys are so tight. Aren't they great? It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen them. They're, they're so soft as well, aren't they? I know, they? I know. They're, they're placid, you know, yeah. they've got a great temperament. How, how on earth do you end up doing this? Well, like a lot of these reindeer here today, I was born into. Um, so you were born into it? Yep, I was born into it. It's my family business, and uh, me and my, my brother were both born into reindeer herding. All right. And uh, so my family um, took it on in the 80s. They didn't reintroduce the herd. That was a, a Sami man from Sweden that reintroduced the herd with his wife, Dr. Lindgren. There can't be many people who've got a CV saying reindeer herd. I don't even have a CV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the summer now. Do you have to shelter them in the winter or not? No, not at all. Um, they head further into the hills in the winter. You know, we do very little with them in the winter. Um, being an Arctic animal, they are totally um, ready for all conditions the caring is going to throw at them. Um, and if we don't see them in the middle of winter because the conditions are too harsh for us to either drive, walk out onto the hill, then we leave them to it. You know, they get on with it. Fantastic. Is that why they've got such big feet? Absolutely. It's their snowshoe. It's snowshoes. So it spreads snow. their weight, it digs through snow, it, they'll walk and put the same footprint into the front as their back, so they're using the same compressed snow as at once. So everything about reindeer is designed to save energy, uh, to keep them warm. Minus 20, minus yep. 30. They don't feel the cold till it hits minus 35, and they can survive down to minus 70. I know we're in Scotland, but it is like looking in another country, isn't it? Yeah, seeing this. yeah it's <laughs> extraordinary. I mean, you really could be in the Arctic Circle. That's what it feels like. Thank you so much for that. No, you're absolutely welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, that was a real treat. Thanks. Good, I'm glad you enjoyed All right. it. All right, guys. Take care, take care. How amazing is that? That's incredible. And you didn't even know they were in Scotland, you see? No, I didn't. I'd kind of heard about them, but I'd never seen them before. But I really genuinely think you ought to get some. Can you fit them in a mini? <laughs> While Nick ponders the notion that reindeer are not just for Christmas, I found a place just four miles south by the beautiful Loch and Elan for my next cook. So I thought for my first dish I'd utilise the amazing salmon that they have from these parts. Now, I'd be lying if I said this salmon comes from here, behind me. There's pike, apparently, in here. I'm not cooking with that. It's far too many bones in it. But this, I thought I'd do a simple little brunch dish using smoked salmon and serve them with a nice little dill pancake. So, starting off with the pancakes, I've got some plain flour in here, together with a little bit of baking powder. And these are like little risen pancakes. And then this is where we separate the eggs. So I want the egg yolks in one and the egg whites in the other, because these are going to be light and fluffy. And because of that, the baking powder will help, but also 
the whipped egg whites will help a lot. So we'll just separate these and use your hands going from shell to shell, palava, messing around. So a bit of salt and pepper in the egg yolks and then just going to chop up some dill quickly before it ends up in whales. Chop it all up, stick that in the bowl quick. And then I've got some milk. We're creating a little batter with this. Mix this together first of all. Like that. Try not to make it too thin at this stage. That's what we're looking for, really, with our nice little batter. And turn our attention to the egg whites. We can lightly whip up our egg whites. Just whip these all up. This will create a much lighter pancake. And with that baking powder in there, it'll be nice and light. It's much easier with a machine, to be honest with you. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> Mix this together. And then we're creating when you fold this all in. The more time you have messing around, the less likely your pancakes will rise. That's the kind of mixture that we're looking for, like that. So once you get to this stage, we can simply cook these using some butter. Block of butter. You butter the skillet. I love that. And we're going to pop our nice little pancakes onto our little skillet. There. So we just cook these nicely on a skillet. And these want about two minutes one side, turn them over, two minutes the other side. Once you get to that stage, flip them over. But you can see the baking powder and the whipped egg whites puff them up like little blinis. So once you got to this stage, We'll then take these off, and these can ha quite happily sit there. So next, get our pan on the stove. And I'm going to do this with a little bit of scrambled eggs. So for scrambled eggs, we just need four eggs. Like that. In the pan. They're going to go in. Black pepper. I know I'm using the same bowl for people. This has already had eggs in it before you start to pick up the phone. To be honest, I was going to do duck. That would cause a bigger problem. And then, this is the secret. Double cream. Double cream. Don't start changing this and use low-fat double cream. And then what I'm going to do is grab some of this amazing smoked salmon. And then what I'm going to do is just chop this all up and fold this into my scrambled eggs. But look, get a nice little bit of foaming butter. Now, the key to scrambled eggs is do this slowly. So pour the eggs in. And when you add them, don't stop whisking. You see now it starts to thicken up? Then you take it off the heat. Then you add the salmon. You see, look, it should be like that. So I'm just going to keep that warm on there, and then we can just plate this. And I've got these pieces of smoked salmon that we can just put on here, like that. Then take some of our nice little dill pancakes. A bit of dollop of creme fraiche as well. If you want to do that with the smoked salmon. Nice little bit of wedge of lemon. Serve that with it as well. But then, of course, it's about the scrambled egg. So there you have it. A great brunch dish of smoked salmon, warm little dill pancakes, and scrambled egg with smoked salmon. Done. It's a magical part of the world, is the Cairngorms. If you've ever up in Scotland, you've got to drive past and visit it. It's beautiful. Still to come, we've got recipes from top chefs, Richard Corrigan, and the genius that is, Claire Smith. But I'll see you here in a couple of minutes when I'll be whipping up a moussaka for Luke Evans. I'll see you in a bit. Wow. 
welcome back. Now, coming up, Chef Richard Corrigan will be sharing a recipe of partridge, and uh, Nicola Lando will be here with some Christmas gift ideas for the foodies in your life. But first, I'm here with a Welsh actor who's taken Hollywood by storm and is now doing the same in the music world. It's the amazing Luke Evans! <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. The big love for you in the house today. This is very nice. Well, it's all right, isn't it? Mm. It's been a break from the norm for you. Absolutely. And uh, I, I, if I could get a round of applause with everything I did. Yes. <laughs> but, <I> yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll organise that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're just going to... I know you're a big lover of food. And I know, I'm surprised you get time to do any cooking, to be honest with you. But uh, moussaka is another one of your big loves. Love it. So I'm going to show you how to cook a moussaka. The moussaka, we've got all the ingredients over here. I've got some uh, little bit of oregano there. We've got some cumin. We've got some coriander. Uh, as some uh, cinnamon, sorry, and we've got a little bit of garlic, some uh, onions, some lamb mince, some wine, and, and we're just going to throw everything in a pan and get that started. Is that Welsh lamb? It is Welsh lamb, of course, exactly. Good. So, so, well, first of all, I want to talk about grow, growing up in Wales. Okay. It's slightly different to Hollywood. <laughs> it, couldn't, <laughs> it couldn't be more different. But you couldn't have imagined, could you, as a career that you had? No, no, none of this was planned. None of it. I'd like to say it was all a big master plan of mine, but no, it wasn't. It was. Um, was it ever in a dream of yours? Nothing, nothing. No, like I, my dad's a builder, my mum's a cleaner. You know, we. But they were both into music. We didn't answer the music. I didn't they like were... music. We, yeah. We had, like, 45s, you know, my, they were quite young when they had me, so they were still in the music, the record-buying part of their life. And yeah. so I, I, I grew up with, like, 45s of, you know, David Bowie, the Beatles. You know, but Welsh music, sir. You got, I mean, you got. Oh, we always there. Well, that's always around. You know, whether watching the rugby or you know with the friends on the weekend in the, yeah. in, the in a pub or something. Um, yeah, Welsh Just, music. Music is always around Welsh people. Because really. although you travel, you still got that Welsh twang in your voice as well. I do, I do. Well, you know, whenever I'm around somebody with an accent like yourself, you've like got me, an accent. Yeah. <laughs> mine comes out, and I love it. You know, it always fascinates me how small the United Kingdom is and the diverse amount of accents there are everywhere, and it's it's a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing. So we're just going to throw this lot, th throw this lot in as well. But I want to talk about how how you end up from some Wales to to London because you you went there with a dream of uh, of acting on stage mm -hmm. and, and 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 musicals and stuff like that before bit the big screen. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. was that transition for you for a boy from Wales moving down to London? Because that must have been a. I mean, I remember going down to London when I was a young kid, yeah. sixteen years old. It's a, didn't like it. I, it was a massive... It, it, it takes a while for you. You either love it or hate oh, it. it. took me yeah. a while, I think. Oh, I was ready. Right. <laughs> you were ready. I was, re I was ready at 12 years old to move to London, but right. um, I waited till I was 17. Like, so, I, I arrived the day Princess Diana actually died. Can you imagine? I turned up in a city that was grieving. It was a surreal thing, but, yeah. Wow. Yeah, but wow. Um, love, love the city, and, and considering I, I came from such a small little village, you know, I, I sort of... I've, I've loved it. Well, the city went on to love you because, I mean, the West End as well. You, you, then, you then do this, you get the scholarship, you're, you're, you're studying music, you're studying uh, acting and everything else, and then, then to go into musicals like you did... Yeah. You, you, I mean, you were going in some, some, some amazing, amazing parts, but am yeah. amazing, you know, really established musicals. Yeah, some big ones, some original shows. The first show I ever did was I was, tw I was 20, 21. Um, and uh, the year 2000 was my first show in the West End, and uh, yeah, did some big ones: um, Miss Saigon, Taboo, the Boy George musical, uh, Avenue Q. Um, sometimes I was the lead, sometimes I was supporting actor. Was it, was it the acting that got got you that, or was it the the the, the music, the the singing? Well, it, I... to be a musical theatre, you have to be able to sing, but I think you know, musical theatre actors also have to be able to act through their singing, you know. Yeah. So. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a quite a thing to do, and then do it live and eight times a week, you know, it's twice It's very different a... to what you're doing now, you know, it's... Well, yeah, now what I do, you know, in, in film and TV, you work 12 hours a day, it ends up being around a 14-hour day. So, you know, my work ethic is, is strong, you know, yeah. I, I like working. That's your Welsh upbringing, you say. Yeah. That's what, that's what that is. Well, yeah, we're working-class lads, you know, and we all know how to, you know... So we're going to get on to what happened afterwards, but tell, tell me about the music then, because you're here to tell us about this. This is... This I is, hope your hands are clean, James. They're, they're clean, they're clean. That's the first just, album just I've even seen. You haven't even seen this, no, have you? No, no. Let me have a look. There you go. Good, because I've got another one. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look at that. It's really amazing. You haven't, you, this is the first time you've seen yes. it. Yes. 
They've only just been printed just for you, James. Yeah, but look, you've got oh, the... That's amazing. Proper CD in it. Look at that. Do, you, must, you must pinch yourself, because it's like, a, a, like publishing a book, isn't it, really? Because there's something close to your heart with this. Wow, yeah, I mean... Tell from your face, look. Yeah, it's like... It's, it's mad. It's yeah. mad, and it's... <laughs> you know, it's, it was made with with a dream, and this is like, to do it a second time and to, and to really have the opportunity to, to think of all the other amazing songs I wanted to sing and then, you know, have the opportunity to sing with an incredible orchestra. I've been writing with an amazing songwriter called Amy Wodge, and She's, I had I mean, lots of ideas. Talking about that, mate, you've just dropped in a name. She's written for some amazing... From Diana Ross to Ed Sheeran and uh, <laughs> uh, 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 literally, like, Andrea Bocelli, and then she's a fellow Welsh person like me, and. Um, we just clicked the second we met, and uh, we met just before COVID happened. Right. I then went to the States, spent my lockdown in the States, and she was in her home in, in South Wales, and we used to Zoom and write together every week just to pass the time, you know. Because this is one of the tracks on the album. Two of the tracks. Two, yeah. two tracks on yeah. the album. So. Yeah, yeah. Because is, we're going to uh, play one of them anyway. Tell, tell me about... Well, track three on the album is called Horizons Blue, and it was, um, I think it was the second song we wrote together, and I... Uh, I wrote them. I wrote the lyrics really quickly. I didn't really know what I was writing. I was just writing, rhyming, you know, poetry. You know, this, that's this sort of what songs Because you, you were there in the sunshine, were you? Is that, is that the reason why? Well, yeah, yeah. I did have a blue horizon that day, and uh, and obviously there was no one. I rented this little, this little house on the beach. I mean, it sounds very glamorous. It wasn't that glamorous, but it lo it felt very nice because the beach was empty, and all all the wildlife had come back. And so I was just looking out to the ocean. It was magical, and I just, you know, we were all going through like this worry and, 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 and anxiety of what was going to happen. There was no, there was no, um, uh, um, you know, vaccination at that point, so we were all living in a little bit of fear and worry for our loved ones. But I had a very optimistic moment that morning, and I saw horizons blue. It reminded me of of good things and positive things, and so I, you know, Adele is one of my favorite artist. She writes about love, loss, happiness, finding it, losing it, whatever. And I thought, I'm going to try and write one of my own. And well, that's what I came up with. Shall we see what the end result was, right? Because we've got it now, so we've got it for you to listen. But here we go. In that moment we were chosen and we knew We decided our horizon should be blue Anywhere that you will go, I will go there too in that moment I was chosen to fall in love with you, to fall in love with you. A man of many talents, a man of many talents. Amazing. So we've got our aubergines over here. The, the lamb mince, you, you want to cook this. I've just put everything in. You, know, you cook this lamb mince. Uh, you want to cook it for a good sort of 20 minutes, uh, something like that. Season it up, allow it to cool down slightly. And we've got our aubergines over here. So we're just going to colour these nicely. The key to this is try not to add too much. Aubergines contain quite a lot of, well, they're like a sponge. And the temptation is to add more and more oil into it. And then all of a sudden they just dump them out. Um, so we're just going to take this off to one side, let that cool down slightly. I've warmed up my milk, and now onto our little sauce that we've got in here. So we're going to take our little sauce. This is the the white sauce where you take some butter. There we go. So Luke, in this house we use quite a lot of butter. So, how to make bechamel sauce. So this is how to make it. Now the temptation is to measure butter. You're just chuck looking at it. You're just chuck it in. <laughs> so just chuck it in. Um, you just chuck it in. And, and the key to this, salted really... Salted butter or unsalted butter? It makes no difference to this, because we're going to season it anyway. So what you do is you start off with a whisk. Plain flour, and it happens quite quickly. You've got to be quite confident with this. A lot of times with white sauces, it can go lumpy, because you're not confident with it. Is that because you've got to stir it all the yeah. time? Yeah, so you can see now we've got this. Then we throw in the flour. Oh, all in one go? Yeah. Mm, so then wouldn't be the roux that. itself... I'm terrified. Is, is, the roux itself is, is not too thick. Then... We grab our milk, and now we start adding it. But there you have your white sauce. Easy as that. So if you wanted to put a little bit of cheese in it, cauliflower mm. over the top, Mornay. A little Mornay. bit of mustard, maybe, but that's, that's your nice little white sauce. Done. Wow. wow. You can put an egg yolk in there, bit of salt, 
bit of pepper, and now we start to layer it all up. So I'm going to bring this over, and we're going to layer this layer this mous this moussaka up, and then just bake it in the oven. So tell me about the the the, the film career, because we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. But there's so much to talk about in terms of your film career. Your first, you you, kept, you sort of got into it slightly later, didn't you, Eddie? Um, was it 29 something like that? You got into it? Yeah, yeah, it was late. Past? Yeah, I, I spent. Um... Eight years doing musical theatre, and, um, and uh, at around 26, 27, I made a pact with myself that if it wasn't gonna, if I wasn't going to be moving the needle at all in in the in, in the business, I was going to leave it at 30. Really? Yep, I decided, and I wasn't. It didn't bother me. I'd had a good run, but I was like, I need to. What is that? Because they're just knockbacks. Because I mean, there's you're not in... enough money in it. <laughs> it wasn't like I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't able to like save any money. I was thinking I'm an only child. I got to look after my mum and dad. And I was like, I just wasn't been able to save. I didn't couldn't save. You know, London's an expensive place anyway. So I'd made a decision, and then, and then. Uh, the movie and the movie thing happened. Just the movie thing just happened. Just it sort of didn't film? just happen, but it sort of came out of the blue because I, I managed to get myself into a play at the Donmar Warehouse, which was a uh, was something I never thought I'd be able to do. And um, from that, I got an agent in America. I got a manager in America, and within eight months, I was in my first movie, which was Clash of the Titans, and I just wrapped my forty-fifth movie last night. 45. That deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> and it, it, it's, yeah. it's still only still only 36. That's it's still only 30, 36. 36 <laughs> next week. Exactly. Look, we're going to take this this now. We'll just finish this off because we're going to talk. Like I said, we'll talk about all your music career. But look, you've oh got my your God. Look at that. So that's your white sauce, your classic white sauce that we just put over the top like that. It originated in Greece. Greece, right? yeah, Greece. There's, like I said, there's, there's variants of it all over the place. So, so different countries will have their own variants of it. It's, it's, it's it, you know, it doesn't have to be the same in each of the places. So, a little bit of cheese. Cheddar. This is a bit of cheddar. I so. made um, shepherd's pie two nights ago from scratch, and I put um, pecorino cheese on top of it. That's fantastic. Well, pecorino cheese is the one that they put on pizzas. Yeah. So you know why pizza tastes salty? Yeah. They don't use buffalo milk, they use cow's milk and use pecorino cheese. And then when you bake it, it's got that lovely salty crust. That's what it is. That's pecorino. So what we can do is just pop this straight in here. And then this is one that's been in the oven. Look. Oh my God, look at that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then wow. this one goes back in here. And you want to cook this for about 30 minutes, because don't forget, everything's cooked it's anyway. It's already cooked, yeah. You can, yeah, if everything's hot and, and you assemble everything hot, you just got to put it into the grill. But season each layer as you go. And then we'll just serve this. And then it's ready to eat. So we'll just you bring this across. It looks so easy, James. Well, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is like... Um, it's, it's, just, it's just like eating volcanic rock, to be honest. This is because it's a bit hot. Yeah. But we'll let it cool down slightly. But... I'm Welsh. Everything is piping hot in Wales. But look. Look at that. I mean, I just remember this is this is how I had moussaka. This this layer of stuff on. I love Beautiful. this. Don't get me lasagna is ace, but moussaka is just yeah. It's those old Probably genie bits. Healthier without the pasta, maybe. Oh. <laughs> no, with all that cheese on the top. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the amount of. Oh, don't about that. You just ignore the half pack of butter that you're missing that's out there, and then we just took a few bits of leaves. But mm. there you have it. It's a nice little simple dish. Some things to eat to start with. Hopefully you like that one. Done. <laughs> there we have it. Your first dish. What? Save room for your ham, egg and chips a little bit later. Oh, don't worry. I can eat. <laughs> I can eat. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's delicious. Wow. It's lovely, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great dish. Really, really good. There you go. Um, he's happy with that. That and a good actor, I know that. Uh, mm. They'll be cooking a second course for Luke at the end of the show. And Chef Claire Smith will be putting her three Michelin star twist on a simple potato, very surely. But join us after the break. You're enjoying that, are you? Oh, my God. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Join us again after the break with my good friend Richard, Richard Corrigan. We're firing up the stoves outside. I'll see you in a minute.
welcome back. Now, we're taking bangers and mash to the next level in this week's Little Masterclass. But first, I'm here with a treat because I'm here with a chef who's been serving mouth-watering food at the hospitality industry in London for over 25 years. It's the one and only Richard Corrigan. Thank you, James. Uh, now, I love your food over here. And the way I love about it, you're, you're as passionate about cooking on open flame as what I am. Yeah. Really? So every time you're on here... <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, Luckily, we're in the winter, because yeah. you nearly set my hedge on fire <laughs> last time you were here. I think you nearly burnt this down. I think yeah. you weren't far <laughs> off, to be honest with you. Now, partridge. I love partridge. Yeah. What, what are you going to be doing These with These were now? shot in Great Windsor Park. Uh, basically, I've spatchcocked them. Uh, partridge just cooked on the bone can, you know, you can, uh, a few minutes off, they're very dry and very boring. And yeah. partridge can be a little bit uninteresting. Yeah. I think it's amazing value if you just... But as all the game birds go, this is probably the good one to start yeah, with, this I, I is think. This is a great one to start Often with pheasant, it can be too strong, people are not too sure with it. I think partridge are great, because you can spatchcock it like you've done there. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, here I've just used a little bit of a Lincolnshire poacher butter. Right. Fresh cumin. Okay. Uh, which is um, supplied to me by an amazing lady in London. And I made a little bit of butter, and I've just put it in under the skin, because there isn't a lot of fat on the partridge. Yeah. And as you can see... So this is keeping it slightly moist. This keeps it. it slightly moist. Pass it out nicely, yeah. and then we'll just use th that in there, and we'll bring it over to that one. You can and get your get butcher to spatchcock the chicken. The spatchcock, the yeah. butcher will spatchcock them for you, no problem at all. So basically you can have them like that. And what I do then is season them. Yeah. Tiny bit of cumin as well. Okay. On it. And on the far side, just wash my hands here. Right. On the far side, a little bit of... Just a little bit of zesty lemon. Yeah. Now, last time you were here, you were just about to open a, a restaurant in Ireland. You've, you've never yeah. got it up and running. It's, uh, it's opening in the next few days, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... <coughs> the chairs... The tables came, but the chairs didn't. Oh, right. <laughs> I have stories about Welcome that Welcome to the world of running restaurants, Welcome isn't it? And the setting world. up restaurants, yeah. and I know what he feels like as well. And... Yeah. Now, that's just... Just a little bit of seasoning on there. Now, we won't touch that raw bird anymore. We just use the skewers. So you want me and to put this on? Would you put them on, James? Yeah. I'm just going to turn that And around. I'll cook the other one, should I, as well? Please why, do. Why not, why not do both? Yeah. Why Please do. do. There you go. And, and when, you do, when you're doing it like this, they're not going to take very long at all. Uh, I mean, it's three, three, like three, three and a half, four minutes. Three, four minutes. That's three, four it. minutes. Yeah, exactly. And what I'll do, I'll just use this tender stem. I've kind of peeled the skin up there. Just peeled them just very... Right. Down the back. Done, done, done. And these ones they can go on at the very end. Yeah. I'll make sure they're looked after as well. Yeah. And this is about, you, you love putting this, 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 tell us about this, which we've got here. This is a little this... aberico, sh chorizo. Yeah. Oh, uh, chorizo. And I really, I really enjoy it. I enjoy cooking with it. Right, so we got so our, what, this, what is, this, is, this, is then... this is the butter that's causing a little bit of this. Yeah, keep, yeah. Just keep your eye on it, it's fine. That's fine. That's... And then, then over there wow, we've got, lovely. it's looking good. So tell yeah. me about what you've got in this pan over here. So then. I have some green lentils on here. Yeah. With a small bit of vegetable just cooked in olive oil. And I have some of the quail bones we've made into a gravy. And what I've done here is a little bit of Spanish, really good vinegar. And I just put it in there. Oh, sherry vinegar. Yeah, and a little bit... Sherry vinegar and lentils, though, they're just... They are... They make, they make just take... They take ah. it to a different level, don't they? I mean, that's grown-up food. Yeah, and in here... Grown-up food. And in here I have just green chilli. Yeah. Green chilli. And then you just mix it around. I don't want a gravyish. I just want to dress. What's the little? What is the the herb you got? In the the herb, just some parsley. Right. Okay. And nothing more than that. So we have our cumin there. We have that done. Now we mentioned we mentioned quince earlier as well. So oh. Where, where does the quince? Because uh, quince is one of those things that I grow. I grow pears here. There's a little pear tree. Pear tree there. I've never actually tried growing quince here, but well, I'm assuming it's not too bad. But... Well, it's not. I, I put quince down eight years ago, and we have our, our first quince coming. Uh, every year, uh, they're 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 kind of, you know, they're not as abundant as apples. So yeah. you know, when you see it, you can count our quince on our trees. Yeah. And but one of the things that uh, I think it's one of those things. What what do people do with it when they look at it? Because it looks yeah. it's a cross between a pear and apple. I mean, but you stew it with sugar traditionally. Stew down with sugar and just here, this is just a puree of quince. Yeah. And but that's know. what it that's what it looks like when you when you kind of see it really. If you see quince. Yeah. Quince puree I mean, that's, normally. That's just, that's just delicious. I mean, a bit of sweet wine, you could put a bit of sauterne in there and cook it down, puree it up, 
and it's the most delicious thing. It's almost like a kind of an ala minute chutney instead of having this in the fridge for two, two days or ten Taste, weeks. Taste is amazing. Like I said, with cheese or, or, or particularly, you know, stuff like this. But even desserts are amazing with quince. Desserts is wonderful. Yeah. And there, there are almonds, which are roasted now. We're just going to take a few of those. Yep. And this is just that kind of... We put our almonds and lentils in there together. See, this is what I love about your cooking. It's... You know, just everything in there. Let it soak in. So t tell everybody, if oh, you're yeah. over in Ireland, what, what, tell us about, about your restaurant there. Well, the Park Cafe in Dublin, it's in Ballsbridge, South Dublin. Yeah. It's an uh, all-day breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yeah. And what I want from it is basically it's just all the ingredients we grow in the Virginia Park Lodge. We just... We... Oh, yeah, James, just perfect. Look at that. Yeah, lovely. Because you've, just, just, yeah, yeah, you've, got, you've got a massive garden and, and, and a colossal amount of gardeners we there. Have, we have 22 Sunday backs, which the first three went to the otherwise known as Christmas puddings, basically. They're right. Oxford Sandies. They're a wonderful English rare breed. Yeah. The meat is quite dark. Of course, all the chefs want the middle part for the double chops. Yeah. But it's the rump. You know, we'll make schnitzels. Else. We'll make the schnitzels. We, we, I'll take a plate, James, there well, from we're, you. We're a pig farmers, so, we, so ah. you're kind of used to all that sort of everything. You utilise everything, don't you, really? Right, so, so basically... So just to recap what you've got in here, you've got a few diced veg. This is the a dice of uh, carrots, celery, and onion. Yeah. Uh, the almonds are lightly roasted in a pan with a little olive oil. So this is just a salad of lentil. You, you say, say that, but I can smell it from here. So I'm just going to have... Well, you just plate that, I'm going to have a taste yeah. of this. Because there's not many chefs. I, I, to, when I say we, I'm quite privileged on the show, we get a, a vast amount of chefs coming onto, onto the show and great friends. There aren't many chefs that can cook like this gentleman. There really, really aren't. And in here, then, we have a little bit of lemon. And I love your food. And really... I mean, is there a thing, as you get older, it's called effortless? We talked about this a long time ago. Yeah. It's about a lot of knowledge. A lot of the kids now are great cooks. Yeah. Their depth of knowledge is out there. They know every technique in the book. They can't cook. But they can't, they can't brown a rib in exactly. a pan. <laughs> so they're brilliant. They're brilliant. Exactly. They're brilliant. But I don't think... I think to cook, you need to enjoy eating. Exactly. And, a lot of and cooks, this is the reason why we wear these like, things. We wear these things it's to make it's us a, look... It's a took us all in. Very <laughs> took us. Very took about. <laughs> and what we have, it's Christmas time. Go on, tell us what these bits are, then. What, these what are just... It's a piece of pear from our orchard, and basically it's just pear in a little bit of uh, vinegar, sugar. You know, look at that. I mean, James, beautiful. Just Perfectly cooked, Chief. Look, and, and you know what? A little bit of chorizo. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I love this gentleman. Richard Corrigan, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, I'll pop that on there. Yeah. So there you have it. So give us the name of this dish then, like you're going to sell it in your it's restaurant. It's English partridge, chorizo, quince, pickled pears, and lemon gel with lentil salad. Oh. <laughs> so a bit of a Spanish kind of North African movement going on in there somewhere. You There's know? a bit of everything in yeah. there, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I love the almonds with it as well. Yeah. Do you know all the English cook cookery writers of my of my childhood, my youth, Francis Bizzle and Jane Grigson and all these, Elizabeth David. They were eccentric. Some of them were quite eccentric recipe writers. And when you read those recipes, you were really inspired by, you know what I mean, just by how good a recipe writers they were. Yeah. I just still love and looking at those recipes. Uh, well, I know you do, but you love cooking more. And this is this is this is this is as nice as plate of food you're going to get taste-wise. That's why I said to, said to chefs, it's got to taste well first. It has to taste good. Do you know what I mean? It's got it to taste. To, it has to make you feel. It has to make you feel, wow, that is something. What wine? Get me the sommelier. Get me the wine waiter. Yeah, get me the wine waiter. Yeah. It's my house. <laughs> yeah. Go, go right myself. <laughs> Richard Corrigan, everybody. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Brilliant. Now, you're going to stick around as well? Yeah, yeah, I'd love that, to. Clear uh, cooking, that, wow. That wine cellar is definitely going to get hit with him sticking around. <laughs> uh, now, I'll be laying on um, lunch of a marmalade glazed ham for Luke Evans later on in the show. And I'll be showing you how to make the perfect bangers and mash in this week's Little Masters. But after the break, Nicola Lando will be here with some brilliant ideas for gifts for a foodie this Christmas time. I'll see you in a bit. Look, he's still, he can't help himself. He's still cooking. Good. <laughs> this is for the crew. <laughs> well,
welcome back. Now we're chatting some more to the actor and singer Luke Evans later on in the show, and I'll be making some epic bangers and mash in this week's Little Masters. But first, there's a week to go until Christmas. Yes, one week to go, and if you need some ideas for what to buy the chef and foodie in your life, then don't worry, cos I'm here with a woman that can help you solve all that from Sous Chef. It's the brilliant Nicola Lando! <laughs> Great to have you on the back. Now, you're Thank also you joined much. by just a selection of some amazing chefs. Claire Smith, welcome to the house as well. Great to have you. And Richard Corrigan, of course, Thank as well. You so you got you brought along some little things, and we're going to get onto the chefy things a little bit later, but uh, over to you. So over to you, the gadgets for Christmas, because as a foodie, we all want these little things, these little gadgets, these little foodie little things, because that's hand-in-hand hand with Christmas, isn't it? Yeah. So starting with pasta making... Yes. Um, Italian food is amazing because it's so ultra-regional. Yeah. And so not only the ingredients totally different in different areas, recipes totally different, we also get different types of pasta-making kits. So these, tell so, us what these are, because I thought these were originally biscuit <laughs> uh, stamps, yeah. that kind of stuff. So they're corsetti. Um, they're from Liguria in northern Italy. Right. So you cut out the little disc there. With this. Um, and then you drop, you kind of shake it out. Yeah. And then you put that disc... <laughs> well, I'm not Italian, that's just a good start, isn't it, really? <laughs> put yeah. the disc back on the top yeah. um, of that one. Take one of the other stamps, of that press one? it together, and you get this beautiful design on both sides. And then you press that. Yeah. And so those were first used, or they first were known about from a medieval cookbook, probably one of the oldest cookbooks in Italy, from the 1300s. Um, and then around a little bit later, 1400s, 1500s, um, noblemen would put their coats of arms on the stamps, so you'd have you know, your branded dinner. Um, and if you your brandy <laughs> dinner. Now, uh, now I yeah. thought that when because you get biscuit stamps like this as well, don't you? Really? I mean, I've seen a few biscuit yeah. stamps like this, but these look at that. It's beautiful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Look at that. It's great. So that, and then this is also a pasta. T tell us what this is, because this is. I, I've not, Claire. You said you've seen one of these yeah. before, but I haven't seen this before. So this is a chitara um, or a guitar from um, Abruzzo, right. in kind of east, south, central Italy, and you can. You know, it's like the strings. You can play them, and so you lay the pasta. James yeah. can play that. Uh, yeah. Well, there I don't know go. about that. Well, it, it might sound a little bit better than some of my guitars. <laughs> not in tune at the moment. So yeah. the idea is what? You make the pasta instead yeah. of having I mean, it. Is this... Oh, it's double-sided double as well. It's double-sided. It's slightly thicker on one side than oh. on the other side. Oh, you see? Look at that. And then what you do, you just... I, I can't you believe see. I'm doing this for the first time. On... <laughs> you roll it along, and so then the pasta falls through. Right. Um, and then you get this perfect square um, cut-through of pasta. So instead of the round spaghetti, you get something which picks up a little bit more sauce. Look at that, um, yeah. And that's called pasta al chitara. Al chitara. Look at that. That's cool, isn't it? Look at that. Mm -hmm. Very simple little thing. So yeah. where does this come from in Italy? Um, Abruzzo. Right. Central OK. East, so we've got pasta, we've covered that. Now, where, where else are we going? Where, where else in the world are we going? So these pots are made in Holland. Right. However... Um, there are two different types of fermentation pot for making sauerkraut, for making kimchi. Yeah. Um, they're made by two elderly Dutch potters, who every time we send them an email will always say, we're two elderly Dutch potters, you know, this will take a while. <laughs> um, and they're wonderful. So That's these just an two... excuse for saying, stop bugging us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Probably. Exactly. Right. Probably. Or, we're, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of care. So these two are the traditional Polish and German-style sauerkraut pots. Um, and if you look, they have these weights. So you, you stuff cabbage inside, and then you pop these weights in to weigh it down. And then it's got this lip that you pour water into, put the lid on, um, and then as the cabbage ferments, it releases the carbon dioxide. That can then displace all of the oxygen, so you don't get mould on the top. Um, so it's just the water keeps the, keeps, the, keep, keeps the seal, yep. but also the water will help the gas released when it's fermented. Yeah. So, so you the know? gas releases happening. Yeah, exactly. How cool is that? Yeah. Um, this is a slightly different one. This works really well for slightly wetter ferments. Um, I'm going to show you this just with cabbage that hasn't yet been salted. Yeah. Um, but I'm just going to show you how this one works, because it's slightly different. So you pop your whatever's ready to ferment, yeah. maybe in a brine, maybe kimchi. You put a um, glazed weight on top, yeah. um, and then that drops down. Yeah. Um, and then you have a lid that you pop there. You don't need to have the water seal, but this time you've got this stick which presses down pushes down on that um, pot, and then you have an elastic band, which you tie over the top, um, sitting in that line. And then, as as the cabbage kind of... It always loses volume, more liquid's released, it keeps pressing and pressing and pressing. Every day's that, a school um, day. Ferment. Look at these two. This, <laughs> learning stuff as you go along. So that's what they call the kimchi But that's pot. probably... Well, it's always... It's old school. It's, I mean, that's probably I mean, as traditional as it gets, isn't yeah, it, really? Yeah. 
It's fantastic to see. So, right, we've gone there. This is this is interesting. Now, this 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 is interesting. This next bit, yeah. food in a tube. F so, yeah, it's food left in a me tube. scarred as a life as a kid. To be honest with you, <laughs> you usually at weddings and funerals. Yeah. Now you're bringing it to multi Michelin star chefs at the table. You're bringing food in a tube. <laughs> so, good I, luck. Sell I, it. <laughs> I think these make great stocking fillers. Right. Um, let, let me move, let me move things. these out of the way. Yeah. So go on then. That side. So we've got a few different things. Yeah. Um, one is a classic olive oil that's been whipped into a cream um, that you can you know, put on bread if you, for some reason, didn't want the olive oil. Um, <laughs> but you've not, they've not convinced them at the moment, but anyway, maybe... It, it, it tastes just like olive oil. OK. So I'll, I'll pop a tiny bit on the bread and you can have a nibble. Right. Um, but it's really great. It's a good alternative to butter for vegans or just, I mean, it's, it it gives you a bit of that olive oil flavour. You want to try some? <laughs> Probably more. Do you want a bit more? It's Sorry. It's a corrigan here. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Thank it doesn't, you. It, it doesn't put that much on for his toothpaste. Um, it's olive oil. Very yeah. <laughs> huh? really nice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the equipment? Reading um, the instructions on the back of the bag. It's, 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 it's just water. So it's emulsi really? just emulsified with water and a little bit of salt. And, uh, water. So, yeah. so what, are, what are the other ones then? Well, t t so this is Gianduja, which is classic um, Italian, made her a really beautiful um, confectioner with Pedio hazelnuts, Piemonte hazelnuts um, and, and chocolate. Go and usually up. chocolate spreads, you know, that we all familiar with isn't made with great hazelnuts and also has palm oil in. This I one doesn't. Want it, I, want do you want my, I want it in my hand. You, right, you do that. <laughs> Doing the chef's version, so there you okay. go. So this is like a chocolate hazelnut okay. paste. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good hangover cure, isn't it? Yeah, it's proper. <laughs> it's so good. I can smell the hazelnut. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? And then you're looking at what six got... six six quid, just over six quid for this. Yeah. And these pots, what are you looking at price wise? I forgot um, to go do the price. These are around sixty five. Um, right. And then the slightly different one, which with the press, is about eighty. This one down here. Yeah. And the, this, by the way, is uh, about twenty twenty eight quid. This one <laughs> over here. So, and the stamps are about sort of twenty quid as well. So, moving on, crackers. These these crackers. These are sort of foodie crackers as well. Right. Because yeah. I mean, so many crackers contain stuff you just on, don't break want. Them. Break um, them. So. Yeah. Impulse. Come on. So whereabouts, oh, whereabouts, are, spice oh, whereabouts are these from? <laughs> whereabouts are these yeah. from? Yeah. Um, so we've got Come spices on. from all around the world. Right. Um, so there's a Cajun seasoning. Oh. There you go, it just lands directly in front of you. Cool. That's, That's probably the Cajun yeah, one. Got... Yeah. Um, they've got a recipe. If you've oh. got it, you might have a hat and a food-themed pun, or a foodie joke, <laughs> of course. And these contain uh, spices and all that kind of stuff from Italy, mm -hmm. Middle East, India and South Africa. And a little oh. recipe. Yeah. And I, like that, like a QR well. code for a little recipe. Joke. Go on then, go on. Why did the oyster leave the party early? Because he pulled a muscle. <laughs> <laughs> or he was shell shocked. I'd, I'd stick to cooking, Claire. I'd stick to cooking. I'd stick to cooking. Uh, now, now, last time you were here, you brought some amazing panettone. Your yep. panettone is fantastic. Tell me a little bit about panettone and, and, and what um, should we look for with panettone? So, this one's been made for us in Italy, but really, when you're looking for panettone, you want a few different things. One is definitely may have it made in Italy. Yeah. Um, the second, when you pick it up, it should feel really heavy. Look so at you that. Know Look, you've at got that's lots of... of Christmas. <laughs> Look at the Father Christmas yeah. there, just ripping it apart. Yeah. You've got lots of great time. ingredients. It's really good. It's really yeah. good. You have to. It just tastes like so, that. So, so made in Italy, wow. but the spices are quite the crucial thing as well, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you really smell that aroma, that incredible kind of citrusy aroma. Um, the other one is massive pieces of candied fruit. You can see in this one. It's you can my see that. favourite thing. Mm. <laughs> it is. It's, it's really your favourite yeah. thing. Yeah. It's really I could good. eat a whole one. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that is absolutely great. Yeah. Oh, good. But like you say, there's good ones and there's bad ones. Right. But that's what right. you know. You so want you... ones that you you want it to be able to rip apart. So that's this tearing the... is a really key thing. And actually, when I went to see this producer in Italy, they have the right. sourdough starter sitting in a locked cage. Only two people are allowed access to it. And they have a grandmother of that sourdough starter in a bank vault that no one else allows to access. Um, I and that you makes... had a, I was halfway through <laughs> the, the grandmother in a bank vault. You can't do that, can you? No. <laughs> 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 you can in Italy, maybe. Well, um, who cares? Yeah. But anyway. Um, so it's got that good sourdough, and that's what give it, gives it that lovely tear. But it's the, it's the soft fruit and the mixed mm. peel. That's the, I mean. I mean that and the double espresso, my God, think but, about it. But it's the mixed peel, isn't it? It's, oh. the, it's the fruit that's the, the essential part of this. You get yeah. really good soft fruit and you get yeah. not so good ones. And this how, is... How much is that? That's £23. It's worth every penny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's expensive to make, these things. Well, about to eat about 16 really? quid of it, anyway. They're really hard to make. I love, I love it. <laughs> yeah. 
thank you so much for coming. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, I, I know that our, our three Star Michelin chefs wants to, wants to create a little dish with that and that while I do this end link. So there's a little bit more of your panettone. <laughs> I know she's been, you've been looking at this, wanting to do this. This is the ultimate dish for you that you're going to have today. But there you go. Nicola Lando, everybody. Uh, there you go. All right, Claire will be cooking for us a little bit shortly, but we're serving another course my guest, Luke Evans, a little bit later. But I'll be back after the break with my very special masterclass in bangers and mash. But before we go, go on then, go on then. John's pizza. Go on then, yeah. This will be the, go on then, go on then. Look at this. The depth of flavour in that is fantastic. Yeah, well, pull out. Mm. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now we're treating actor Luke Evans to my marmalade glazed ham with chips and a crispy fried egg. That's what's going to have a little bit later. And Chef Claire Smith will be working her culinary magic on the potato, that's coming up next. But first, talking of potatoes, it's this week's little masterclass, and I'm going to show you the only ever way you'll need to make mashed potato again. But the first thing I'm going to do is serve this classically, sausage and mash. How can you upgrade sausage and mash? Well, I've undone it slightly. First of all, we've got our sausages over here, which I'm going to get uh, cooking away nicely. A little bit of veg oil in here, and obviously a touch of butter. They're going to go in. I've got these amazing, look at these little sausages. They're like little Toulouse round sausages, but these are wonderful little Cumberland ones that local butchers made for me as well. So these are just wonderful little shapes you can get in there. And what I'm going to do is just put a few of these in the pan. I say a few, because there's a fair amount of this crew that will dive into that as well. There. Meanwhile, I'm going to turn my attention not to the mash just yet, but onto the onions for the onion gravy. The onions, this is how to make it really special. First of all, these are just Roscoff onions. Now, these, to be honest, are the king of all uh, onions, really, these. They come from Roscoff in France. They're famous because of the, 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 the chaps in the white and blue T-shirts that used to go around bicycles selling onions. They were called Johnnies, and these fellas used to go around and sell these amazing Roscoff onions. Now, there is actually an onion festival in Roscoff, and they're a particular type of onions. They're just lovely and sweet. They've almost got like a, a lovely sort of uh, purpley, pinkish hue to them when they're, they're, they're fresh. But what you do is you just cook these in beer. And when I say beer, I mean, don't do it in lager. You just cook them in beer. A, a pint of beer over the top of the onions, and you leave them in there, in the skins, cooking away gently for about half an hour. Turn it off, and we end up with these amazing onions. Just look at these. Now, these are just delicious. Uh, on the barbecue, for, if you're vegetarian, these are just amazing just to eat as they are. They're just wonderful on solids. But in here, you can transform these and turn, make an amazing sauce out of them, but you can also caramelise them a bit as well. So what we're going to do is just get a little bit of colour on these sausages, and bits and pieces, first of all. There we go. Turn that over. We'll probably roast that on that one. I'm going to take the whole lot now and just pop it straight in the oven. In the pan, that's all going to cook nicely. Meanwhile, we're going to turn our attention to our mashed potato. Now, mashed potato is one of these things, trial and error, really. The key to potatoes is they are very much a seasonal product. So, really, what I suggest is you look for a particular type of potato. Uh, now, look for something like the Reds, the Yukons, uh, Russets. One of my favourite, favourite bacon potatoes has got to be the Maribel, uh, which is this. So, these are Maribel potatoes. Simply cooked, you don't need to put any oil on it, just prick them with a fork, pop them in the oven, a little bit of salt on it, that's all they need. And once they're still warm, and that's a good tip to do it while they're still warm, you need to pass it through some form of sieve or a ricer. Now, I say a sieve, but this is sort of the, the commercial side of it. This is a potato ricer. Now, you get... This is quite small. You get them in a, in a round one, which you call the... It basically whizzes around like that, and it forces the mooly... It forces the potato through. But equally, it's got these little holes in it. Uh, so rather than use the conventional masher, I would go for something like this. This is much more of a, a domestic version. Now, when you're doing larger quantities, you can then get yourself one of these. This is called a drum sieve. Um, and the reason for this is this sieve just pops out and you get different grades of, of, of mesh in here. Um, I use this quite a lot, really, um, in the restaurant, but my uh, baker really gets upset and the patient section gets quite upset because she ends up with bit of, bits of potato in his flour, uh, bits and pieces when he's using it. But you just basically brush this through with a, with a pastry scrape, scrape as well. But the key to this, really, is whatever it is, make sure you rice it well, ideally while they're still warm. So, not too hot, of course. So, what we're going to do is take our potatoes, like that, cut them, and you can see they're still warm. 
Now, the great thing about the Maribel potato is that the colour and the flavour, you get this amazing flavour from it, but it, it actually means you actually add less... You never thought I would say this. You actually add less butter and cream to it because the actual type of potato makes it much creamier. So we can take a little bowl, make it easier for her. So we just take that, scoop it all out. Now, like I said, either way, you want to make sure the potatoes are dry. That's why a lot of chefs will actually bake the potatoes for mashed potato. But we're just going to cut that, which is like that. But obviously, the best way of doing the mash, of course, well, you get double whammy with the potatoes like this, because you get your potato skins that you can use. But for chefs, what we want to do is just scoop this out. And then, well, before you do this, there's a little, little lunch, really, I suppose. It'd be rude not to. You just get a little bit of butter. Oh, dear. Dear, dear me. Right, look. And we grab our spuds and do this while it's still warm. So the point about this is the little domestic ones are quite small, but if you persevere, you'll be fine. So you just squeeze this through. Now, you see that as you're doing this, what will happen if there's too much moisture in the potato? You're just going to end up with too much water in your spuds as well. So squeeze it through. Now, this is a great way if you're going to do anything like little fish cakes, that kind of stuff. Um, anything, really, that requires mash at its base. I would I'd really invest in one of these, because they are really quite handy, like that. So you just pass it through here. So press it all down. The temptation is, this next bit, though, is to do it with a machine. And this is where your problem starts, really. Maybe not to have another bit. It's really nice. You shouldn't talk well. Well, you can. Who cares? But, uh, but look, you squeeze this through. Now, the temptation is to then do this next bit by machine. What I would always, always urge on is you do this by hand. Because it basically, potatoes contain starch. And some potatoes contain more starch than the other. And if you overwork it, it goes quite waxy. So what you want to do is you want to get this texture. Now, you can see already in here, you've got this beautiful mashed potato, like that. But we can improve this quite substantially with, of course, butter and cream. Now, the best potato I've ever tasted in my life is equal quantities, butter, cream and potato. But to be honest with you, when you've had a, about three spoonfuls, you do need to go for a little bit of lie down once you've had it. But this is where you bring it all together. Now, you put the pan on quite low, and you can see, as I'm mixing it now, the butter starts to melt. Now, some people would say you need to warm the milk or the cream up prior to adding to it, adding it. You, you kind of... You don't, really. The key to it is don't overwork the potatoes. So when you're doing this... So a lot of chefs do it this way. Now, interesting enough with this, once you've made it right, it will actually freeze with mashed potato. But one thing you've got to do is put it in a, an airtight bag and allow it to cool down. Make sure it's nice and tight in that bag so you haven't got any additional water or moisture that's going to build up from ice crystals and that kind of stuff. And then allow it to defrost and then mix it like I'm doing now. Now, it will sort of look a bit like scrambled egg when you're bringing it all back. It looks a bit weird. But if you keep persevering with it and keep going for, what, a good two minutes, like that, three minutes mixing, that will be fine. But you can see very quickly now we've got our mash. So we can then just leave that to one side. I can then hopefully, in our oven, I can then bring this out. We'll then pop this back on here, fire this up to colour our sausages, really, for this one. Because then we can take our... Yeah, these are looking good. So, well, these are cooked, but we're just going to colour these now. It's not pretty good. Look at that. There. Just colour them as well. Now, with that, we can actually take these onions to make a nice little sauce. So, this is where you keep this sort of peel on, or the, the, uh, the skin on. We'll take this off now for this one. You don't eat this. This is just to protect the onion as well while it cooks. But what we can do is just peel this off. Because this makes the most amazing onion gravy, this, this flavour. So we're going to take that to one side like that. 
And very, very quickly, once these are ready, which these are looking good to me, we're going to take our sausages out. There we go. Another one. And always try and put them in a sort of smallish tray to keep the shape. Like that. And then we've got our onions. This is where you can really go to town on these onions. Ooh. You can really go to town on these onions, really, and start to caramelise them. This is why I'm wearing a sort of waistcoat for this, but I don't like the word gilet. Waistcoat. Right, so you do it. Look, that's what you want. You want the caramelised onions with it. Look, take those off to one side. Look. There. Now, in this pan, that we've got all the gubbins in the pan. Now, keep the pan nice and hot. I'm going to leave that to one side. Because this is now just going to finish this off very quickly to make your own simple little gravy. We grab some of these chunky bits of onions. Like, say, this. You just chop this all up. You've got all the gubbins in the pan. The onions are cooked, so this happens quite quickly. The onions go in, like that. You take a little knob of butter and start to fry these off. So now we can finish this off. A little deglazing with a little bit of red wine. This will get all the gubbins from the bottom of the pan. You can use a little bit of beer in this if you wanted to, but what you want to do is reduce this down. So really fire up the stove. Then I've got some of this liquid stock. You'll see this in the supermarkets, where you see a lack of it now, <laughs> really, as we get closer to Christmas. But this is the stock that you want. You want this sort of... It, it's, it's gelatinous. You'll find this in supermarket shelves, in the fridge section, that kind of stuff. And we just heat this up now, and you'll see almost instantaneously you've got a wonderful little sauce. Now we can add a little bit of butter. The French have a wonderful word. It's called montuber. It's to finish a sauce with butter. And you finish it, and you add the butter. Now, it looks as if this sort of fat layer's on the top. As you start to reduce it down, that stock will emulsify into the butter, and that's when you get that perfect texture. That's what you want for your nice little sauce. So while we're waiting for that, we can then plate it up. No stress, no grief. We've got a wonderful little mashed potato. Look at this. And the great thing about using these sort of marises, look, you'll get this classic shape. Look at that. It's like Master Chef the Professionals. Look at this. A bit of that. And the reason for that, you sit the filling in the middle. So you've got a nice little bit of mash. We can grab our nice caramelised sausages, which sits in there. And then we've got these onions. Now these, like I was saying, this is the key to this. These are amazing onions. This sauce is not far off. You see, we can then turn this off now, because that's now ready. But these onions, you can either serve these whole like this, but look, when you, oh, as you pop them out, look. You've got these beautiful little petals. You can pop these around. You need asbestos hands, but other than that... <laughs> I know what will cool my hands down. A bit of that. And then what we do, so you've got this, this very pretty little dish, sausage and mash. Okay. But you keep reducing this sauce down. Now, when you, when you get this sauce ready, you have a little taste. A little bit of salt and pepper in there. Touch your seasoning. It's very nice. It's really, but it's got to reduce enough. That's the key to it. And then all you've got to do with this is just take your wonderful little... Sausage and mash with the onion gravy, with everything else, like that. You've just taken sausage and mash to another level. But it's the same level, it's just different. But in the company that I've got today, I think this joins them at the hip. This. But there you have my version of sausage and mash. And don't forget, now, you know how to make mashed potato. Mashed potato, when you taste it, when you've got the right amount of butter and cream in it there, you should be able to taste it and you should be able to gulp like a goose. <laughs> That's how to make perfect mash. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
There you go. Uh, time now for a quick break, but join me again in a couple of minutes when the three-star Michelin chef, Claire Smith, will be treating us to one of her trademark dishes, and it includes potatoes. But it's not mash. See you after the break. Welcome back. Now, I'll be making the show-stopping marmalade glazed ham, chips and a fried egg for my guest, Luke Evans. God, that's coming up shortly. But first, I'm honoured to be here with a woman who's raised the bar for food. He's nodding over there. In this, he's raised the, he knows what's coming. He's raised the bar in this country and was, without, without doubt, one of the greatest chefs in the world right now. It's the fabulous Claire Smith. <laughs> That was all right, wasn't it? Right? You can add uh, 20 quid in my pocket. There you go. Um, uh, now, tell us what you're doing, because this is, this is, as trademark dishes go, this is the one. Yeah. Yes. Irish roots, obviously, uh, yeah. and as well with this good man here. Uh, grew up a uh, potato farming family by the ocean. There's lots of minerality in the soil. So that sort of seaweed came into that cooking potatoes. Of course, seaweed stores, uses to store potatoes, all kinds of things. So it goes really yeah. well with the. Uh, salted herring roe, smoked, um, smoked trout roe, potato crisps as well is my favourite snack. Just adds a little bit of uh, acidity. Salt and vinegar crisps invented in Northern Ireland. Uh, so, so what do you need first? First of all, it's about the sauce to go with it. Yeah, so we're going to start the sauce. So we've got um, some white wine vinegar and some white oh, wine. I'm going to just there. turn that there on. Go. There you go. Um, we're just going to make a reduction for the beurre blanc. OK. Some white wine, some white wine vinegar. Now, for those people who have been locked away, these foodies locked away forever, tell, tell, tell us about Core, then, cos this is your first venture on your own. Yeah, I mean, Core, yeah, opened in 2017. And, uh, yeah, just over five years old now. And, uh, yeah, it's gone all right so far. It's pretty, pretty good, <laughs> Three pretty busy. It, it's working very well. Encore in Sydney opened just over a year ago. Um, yeah, What's that like running? I mean, running a restaurant in, in Ireland, I suppose uh, that bit of water, it doesn't matter whether it's just over a little bit of water or right over the water, does it really, for you? Um, do you know, it, it's, it was a fantastic opportunity. I've got a brilliant team there. They run it day to day. I mean, I speak to them at the beginning of service or at the end of service. It's kind of like works, it works. And it's amazing how connected you can be these days. You know, just like the, just, just the location and the. The views are spectacular. Yeah, it's stunning. But we FaceTime each other on the pass, so it's kind of like in service, you can watch what, what each other's doing, right. which is pretty cool. Um, so that's just going to reduce down. And then I'm going to show you the potatoes. So we're using Charlotte potatoes as the variety for right. this. And what we'll do is we'll just get them into a pan. We've got some seaweed here. Now, the main seaweed I'd use for this is dulse. Yeah. Dulse and salted kombu. So salted kombu, well, this is just some um, some kelp and you can put sea lettuce in it, whatever you can find, really. But I grew up eating dulse dried dulse as a snack. Did you eat dulse yeah. when you were a kid as well? Very healthy snack. Yeah, lovely. So you grew up so well, yeah. full of iron. And salted kombu, now you can buy this online. Um, salted kombu, you can eat it like that as a snack. Do you ever...? It is, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. But it's super good, full, full of umami. Mm -hmm. um, it is amazing, yeah. It's just delicious. Um, potatoes go in. Normally in the restaurant, we would do this in a sous vide bag. We put it all in a bag because it's obviously more efficient to keep everything in. But for people at home, you can do it like this. Loads of butter in there, just a little bit. <laughs> we don't really put any salt in it because that, that kombu salted. And we would just... I mean, you know, even before you even start, this is going to be amazing, be don't you? Look at... <laughs> So I'm just going to stick that in the oven. You want me to put that yeah, in the oven? Yeah, great, thank you. So how long do you cook that in the oven for? So until they're soft. So I would say that um, would probably be about an hour and a half or so, right. about 150. Always yeah. with a lid on? Always with a lid on. Just really gently uh, comfy them till they're completely soft. OK. I mean, it's in, in the book as well, the recipe, so... But if, if you have well, a sous vide machine... because the home, last time you were here, you gave us the first copy of the, the, the book. The yeah. book is, I mean, spectacular anyway. So what have you got? So you're just reducing that down and then you end up with this, this really strong liquor. Yeah, we're going to make the beurre blanc now. now. as well as, as well, I mean, it's been a spectacular year for you because GQ as well, GQ Chef of the Year Award. I mean, you just, I mean, globally as well. It's just, but it's, it's incredible. I know you work so, so hard at it. Yeah. And, and so dedicated at it. It's a big, it's a big team. I mean, I think, you know, we kind of, 
Yeah, we just crack on. I always say, though, the best thing is the best accolade. And I always talk about it, because you always can get criticism from any guide or from lists, and you go up and down, and yeah. the best accolade is, is the customer sitting in your restaurant. And I just think we're so obsessed by scores and listening to one opinion. It, it's the people that we feed oh, the thousands you of got, people. You go to his place a lot. I know. I it's go to his. It's the same, same thing. <laughs> I go to his restaurants. Yeah, it's just a matter of... But, but, but it is the customer service, it's heavy, it's everything, isn't it, really? That's what makes yeah, a, I think a restaurant special. <laughs> where we feel most comfortable. Yeah, exactly. Actually, so what have you just put in there? Uh, so this is that seaweed which we've chopped up, which is the, the kombu and the, the dulse. And that's just going in. And now we're going to start adding a touch, of, a touch of cream just to start the sauce off. And actually, this can also just be made a bit in advance, like you could, it'll sit. It'll sit as well. That one, that one. So this is, you gradually, gradually add the butter to this. This is yeah. the key to it. A little yeah. bit of cream. The cream stabilises it, doesn't yeah, it, really? Yeah, and it, and it will hold. And you know, that um, seaweed and that kombu and that dulse flavour will come out more and more in it. So if I'm making this kind of for service or whatever, we'll make it up before service and we'll just hold it and reheat it. will reheat, it'll be fine. As long as you don't put it in the fridge, it's quite it's stable. The cream will stop it from separating, I think. Yeah. If you do it without the cream, sometimes it can it can split as well, doesn't it? Yeah. OK. That's the sauce ready to go. Yeah. And then now, very simple, we'll turn so that I'll off. Turn that off, yeah. Right. OK, we've got trout and herring roe. We all know potatoes, uh, baked potatoes and caviar was a thing. Jackie Onassis. Thing. Yeah. But again, when we opened Core, cool, we didn't want to just be all about luxury ingredients and really sort of look around us and think, right, you can use different fish rows. And also, texturally, with the potato, the trout rows, just really. It's really interesting, good. isn't it? It's, it's so, great it's, to see you, isn't it, so, so, Honestly, yeah, it is I mean, really, you're dead right. You know yeah. what I mean? You know? Yeah. But also, why can a potato not be served? And, you know, people yeah. thought I was mad when I opened Core, cool, and we did carrot dish, a potato dish, you're all humble ingredients, because I spent 15 years of my life working in three-star restaurants, using the best ingredients from all over the world, buying the finest things, and I just thought to myself, well, does it really mean anything to me? And so I started to cook dishes like this. First, some people thought, oh, she's mad, she's off her head, she's, what's she doing? This is like, this is not what Claire was doing. And, and then, it just became really well received, and we did win three Michelin stars cooking potatoes and carrots, and and things like that. And, it, and it's those are the dishes we're most famous for and the dishes that are most loved. I think yeah. that what people find is, you know, surprising is, is, is that, really. I'm going to take some of these little chive tips. This is where we do get a little bit fancy on it. The mm. old-fashioned few times. Well, it's just the, the dressing. Are you going to tie it. them up now? No. Normally, if we would do it, we'd do it before service Do you time. remember that when we were at college? Oh, God. You have to it's blanch fine. one of them and tie them up. <laughs> Yeah, just a few little uh, chive tips. That's going to be. Claire, it takes real. It takes real conviction to to keep it simple, but it really does. You know, total focus and belief. Yeah. And I think that as we get older, you become sort of. You just think, well, you know, who am I? What what am I? You know, and it, and it's. I don't think the most important. I thing say is that every single time I walk back into this room. To be honest with you, <laughs> <laughs> with these lot here. Identity is a huge yeah. thing. Well, who are they? <laughs> <laughs> I think having your own identity is an important thing and being true to yourself. I think that's what you got to do anyway. I, th I think uh, television's the same, I suppose. You, you can, you can. There's so many trends that's happening nowadays, and I've never really, never stuck with trends. Even though we do look on point at the moment in our attire on trend. My wife hates you... my jelly. Yeah. Did you? Do <laughs> it's not a jelly. <laughs> It's, it's a waistcoat. Yeah, it's a waistcoat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We just we had a, we had a little uh, we had a little yeah. chat. Did, did that to beforehand, but anyway. It's right. Right. Straight on. Right. It's even the what is that a herringbone thing? Yeah, it's just a. Yeah, we'll we'll get you one. It's fine. Yeah, okay. We'll get you one. Don't worry. I know you're jealous. You haven't got one. We'll, we'll get, look okay. at this. So, so so this obviously we would think okay that's a being fancy and it is and not. But I my favourite snack, salt and vinegar crisps. They add crunch to it um, and acidity. And then these sort of flowers and herbs, yes, of course, they look beautiful, but again, it's a dish that's very rich with lots of, uh, you know, butter and starch in there. And all these little sorrels and herbs bring a lot of freshness to the dish. So we just put a lot of uh, particularly sorrel on it. 
It's just another thing. This to... is what I love. When, when you're on Instagram and stuff like that, you post some amazing pictures about plating. You see, often see, yeah. see the way you plate yeah. stuff. This, I mean, you've got to make, the food looks spectacular as well. I think that it's just, again, about that thing about people have different styles, don't they? And that's kind of something that's always been, for me, quite important. But also, it, it, nature as well This is actually quite important. I do like natural forms of things. I don't like to take things out of their natural form. I think you can play with things too much and you also take away from the flavour and you can, you know, manipulate food too much. I'm looking at this thinking, we've got amag and chips on this. How surreal is this coming up next? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing when you watch another chef cook, as great as Claire. I mean, wow, it's, it's just... I can't wait to get my chumps onto this. But it is a pleasure to watch, isn't it? It really is. So, I mean, the idea of it is obviously something that... It just takes a little bit of time to cook it the day before so that it marinades. The quality of the potato is very, very important. Now, we have an amazing potato grower. Let's say it's Charlotte potato, the variety, but it's got to be something really firm, really waxy that'll, that'll stand up. But... And then we normally just serve that with some let you just slice let of bread. Should pour it on there. But we do normally put a whole jug of sauce on it. So give us the name of this dish. It's called Potato and Row. That's it. Potato and Row. I've always wanted to see this. It's amazing to see it close up as well, isn't it? Like you said. Claire Smith, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, that. It's great. Yeah. Go on, then. Good. <laughs> it's like a kid in the sweet shop. Can I taste one Rich's of these? potato. I, I get it. I get it. I get it straight away. Oh, I'll taste it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mature spot, isn't it? Do you know, do, it's... Do, it's, it's, just said it's, it's just a potato. It's not. It's no. a spot for grown-ups, isn't it? Mm. It's delicious. It really is, and I love that. Taste that. that. My, my mate's got an amazing wow. saying: "This ain't no place for puppies. This is where the big dogs come out to play." That's what that is. Because that that is amazing, absolutely amazing. Tastes fantastic, isn't it? It's absolutely brilliant. Claire Smith, everybody. It's <laughs> brilliant. That. Now you're both going to be sticking around as well, because I need you to practice for my next dish. Because we've still got time for one more final course. So join us again after the break where we're going to wrestle them a festive ham, egg and chips. Claire on the egg, this gentleman on the chips. I'm just going to be messing around with a bit of ham. With a parsley sauce uh, for my guest, Luke Evans. That's after the break. I'll see you in a minute. Welcome back to the last part of the show, but this one's going to be special. I'm back in the kitchen with all my guests, Luke Evans, Claire Smith and Richard Corrigan. <laughs> Now, I've got to say, we've never had this, three of us cooking together. So this is going to, going to be a disaster, I, I, possibly. <laughs> possibly. This, we've got Mr Corrigan on chip duty. Yeah. Claire Smith on fried eggs, who's never practised this. No. I've told her she needed to practise it. She's now decided that to come in raw and just try it. Uh, and then I'm on ham and um, parsley sauce duty. Is that all right? Just stick we, to your zones, guys. We're just going to stick to our zones. But you're here, we want to talk about this album as well, because we played a lovely little uh, uh, song earlier, a song that you'd written as well. Yeah, yeah. Just remind us about the album, because this is the first time you've seen it, so you can see yeah, it again. Yeah, you can hold it a second yeah, time. Go on, then, look yeah, at that. No, um, th yeah, there's two original tracks on the album. There's, um, there's some really famous covers and... Um, there's... You, you, you're not scared about going... I mean, some of these... The I Sinatra, you, James, you've got to throw yourself into the... Some of these are starter tra tracks. You know, you're, you're, you're not frightened of throwing yourself into the deep end. Well, also, a lot of these songs I've been singing my whole life, so um, the only difference is I was doing it professionally now with an orchestra and a choir and, and um, doing it for real, which is almost, uh, you know, it's like a dream come true in a way, you know, when you get to do something for real and 
So um, there's, there's two people that you you sing sort of sing duets with it, this this that's in here. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Nicole Kidman. How did that come up? Because this is a bit of the Hollywood thing. We've got to mention this. Yeah, bit, my Hollywood friend. Go Nicole on, then, Kidman, tell, tell, us, tell us about this thing. Because well, I did a show which I think is actually on TV in the UK right now called uh, Nine Perfect Strangers. Yeah. We shot that in, Aus in Australia during the last part of the lockdown, and um, you know, it was with Melissa McCarthy, Bobby Cannavale, Michael Shannon. Nicole Kidman and many other wonderful actors. And I became very close to, to Nicole, and um, I knew that she had liked my first album. She said her and Keith Urban, multi-Grammy award-winning artist, had listened to my album, so and I'm thinking, this is crazy. Just chuck it in. Go on. And then, you know, I started uh, <laughs> thinking about the concept for the second album, and I thought I'd love to do some duets. And I thought, you know what? If you don't ask, you, don't, you never know. And I thought, I'm not going to have that. Love it. I'm going to make sure I... Uh, I'm going to try and uh, see if she would do it. And, and I called her up and offered up the idea, and she said straight away, yes. I was like, really? So, so you, we, we, we mentioned the sort of the tour. Would, would they ever, would you like to go? Because I, I get the feeling, you know, you got the album out now. There must have been a possibility of doing a tour and bits and pieces, or in the back of your mind, because you love the West End, you love the stage putting the two together, but I suppose timing-wise for you... Yeah, but you can fit it in. You just need a good, uh, you need a good team to schedule it, and, and uh, I've, I work very closely with my team, and we are definitely looking to do some live shows. I mean, you know what it's like. You, you, you do tours and shows, and there's nothing like standing in front of, uh, you know, a crowd of people and all cheering, loving what you do, and... He came know, to the last one. Did, I remember, did you? I was... How was it? Unbelievable. <laughs> really? <laughs> Oh, I I'm was shocked. Coming. Really? It, I was... Full House Palladium. Yeah. Oh. Standing ovations, 20 minutes. Incredible. <laughs> My son said, who's James <laughs> Martin? <laughs> <laughs> I was asking myself that every night, to be honest with you, when we're on it. Incredible. <laughs> no, so I think it is something I definitely want to do. But we're, we're looking at, I mean, looking at the restaurant business, doing what we're doing, you know, it's hard enough just doing two restaurants, yeah. bits and pieces, three, four over there. Wow. In terms of film, how do you... How do you figure it all out? Because to do that many films, I'm assuming you're cross-shooting, you're overshooting... Yeah, you're I'm doing... often, like, doing a movie, learning the lines for another one. Or, I mean, this, this last movie I wrapped very late last night. How many in years London. in advance are you doing? You must be, must be looking at... Um, I got things set for um, <laughs> mid to late 2023. Looking into yeah. 2024, so things have got to be. You've got to be organising yourself. You have to, but not me. It's, I, like this is a this is a lot of other people <laughs> managing all that stuff. I just got to turn up and do my thing, which well, is anyway, uh, you do do it very well. Look, I've just got on here. This this life's too short to show this on camera, um, but you know I feel like I'm wasting ten minutes of a life that I'll never get back uh, if I do this. But these these are little cloves, and you basically stud the cooked cold ham with cloves all over the top. You take some of your... This is marmalade. You've got some beautiful Seville marmalade. Pour it over the top, 200 degrees, pop it in the oven. Then that cooks for about sort of 20 minutes. Keep basting it. We end up with this, which da, is... Da, da, da. Oh, my da, God, da, look da, at da, da, da. that! How many times did you baste that? Uh, this is about six times, this That's one. That's a good ham. It's a good ham? That's a good Does ham. Does it match the chips and the eggs, though? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm worried slightly now, yeah? <laughs> That's a ham. Those chips are getting so much attention, I'm amazed. The eggs are getting so much attention. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Oh, Did you yeah. flick any fat over the top of it? A little bit of fat on top, yeah. Right. Can you do another few more? Is that right? Can you do two more, Chef? Thank yeah. you very much. It's because we got hungry. hungry. <laughs> yeah. I never thought I would have Claire Smith doing fried eggs <laughs> on my show in my house. To I never thought I would be sitting here being... <laughs> Fed <laughs> by three incredible <laughs> chefs. I mean, you haven't I'm tasted not, it yet. And I'm not paying for it. Look, look. It's amazing. The, the pressure of cooking ham, egg and chips is, is, is immense. Oh. Look, but you just got this little oh bit of... Oh, my God, stop it. over the top like this. Over the top. It's, like, it's like almost that. a How nice it. is that? And then... <laughs> you can cut that bit out. <laughs> I'm going to then take a <laughs> slice. We'll just take a nice piece. In fact, take a bigger knife. How does it not um, fall apart? Well, I think because you, you cook it, let it go cold in the... The key to it is once it's cooked... Three-star treatment, look at that. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> once it's cooked, you want to let it go... Uh, we want it to cool down in the, uh, in, in the pan. So as it cools down in the can, it'll f sort of firm up. If you try and... Try so and leave the string on it. Yeah, leave the then. string on it, then take it all out when it's cold, and then gradually wrap it up. But we're then going to grab that. 
Well, well done, you Chef. If you don't like who you're cooking for, you leave a couple of cloves in the middle. You can leave a little cl couple of cloves in the middle, but, yeah, it's just... But, <laughs> that is stunning. Bit of that. Just watch your cloves. There we go. We've got the fried eggs on the, en route. Bit of that. Chips, thanks. the way, chips, thank you very much, Chef. Thank you very much. Wow. I love this. This is... How many good chips? Michelin star chefs. Look at, Look at this. Chips. So, wow. bit of that. Oh There's not going to be anything left on, of this, so um, you just... Uh, thank you very much. Maybe two. Oh, go on. Confidence of a glass of good red wine. Mm. Oh, my God. Let's take a bit of that, put that on there. <laughs> that on there. Look at that. It's a thing of beauty, isn't it? It's Chips. the blanching thing. Which yeah, you don't need I, that steaming sort of thing, Corrigan. Just blanch them. Look. Right. If you do them a little bit, bring them out, put them back in. They've got a bit of a blossom. Yeah. Look at that. And then we've got it's this. Fun. We've got our fried eggs. Wow. We've got a little bit of a parsley sauce. Cooked how my granny used to do. A little bit thick. Fried egg. That one, Chef? Yeah. That That's one. one you want. A bit of white truffle. You'll be home Ooh. and dry now, James, sir. Mm. Mm. White truffle. And I'm going to take these fried eggs. Thank you very much, Claire. So I just put you under pressure like this. And we're going to put these all the way around your fried no. eggs and your ham. Not a cracked yolk in sight. No. Three eggs for three mission stars. How was that for you? Incredible. Look at that. There we have it. I don't think this ever be repeated again on TV. We're only doing it because this is it's Christmas as well, and you're here. <laughs> but there we have it. The world's most expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm egg and chips. Done. <laughs> Boss? I'm ready. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. And a little plate. How are your neighbours, James? They must be. My neighbours? Look at this. We've so got jealous. to go. My mates on the show. <laughs> I can't believe we've actually achieved that, to be honest. Oh, We're all guys, nervous when we before. Can I just say, guys, this is an honour. <laughs> Just to have you three cook me ham cool. and chips and parsley sauce. <laughs> I can't oh believe you're doing God. this. But it's yeah. brilliant. Oh All my God. That. Ham is so soft. Ham and chips. Right? Can't beat it. Hey, the egg, looks, it. egg looks pretty good, Chief. The egg looks all right. That's I think that's somebody who's happy. That's something else. <laughs> that is something else. Wow. Well, the moussaka is a different memory. There you go. Well, uh, wow. Luke, best of luck with the album as well. Oh, album number two. Much. And when you're doing album number three, you've got to pop back and see us. Exactly. We all have to be here. Right? Exactly. We'll, we'll all have to be. We'll come back again. Revisit. There, there um, we go. Thank you so Luke much. Luke Evans, everybody! <laughs> there you go. Well, that's it. That's all we've got time to say. A massive thanks to all my guests. Uh, George Evans, uh, Nicola Lando, Richard Corrigan, Claire Smith, and, of course, Luke Evans! <laughs> thank you very much, team. Uh, we'll see you back here at the same time on Christmas Eve when I'll be joined by more top chefs, other brilliant guests. Until then, take care. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you at my house next week. Bye for now. <laughs>